people that ate their traditional meat-based diet had lower serum vitamin levels, vitamin D levels, but did not get rickets. But if you added flour and sugar to their diet, they would get rickets even with the same vitamin D levels. Hey guys, today the legend Stockwell. He is none other than Dr. Sean Baker. Dr. Sean Baker is a man of many roles. He is an orthopedic surgeon, a national professional a rugby player, and national powerlifting record holder, world champion rower, and so on. He did all this by being lifetime drug and hormone free athlete. And he also worked as a military officer and also as a nuclear weapons launch officer for United States Air Force and he also worked as uh, the combat trauma surgeon in Afghanistan. He is the CEO of MetaRx, the only official platform in the internet for carnivores across the globe to interact and uh, it is a place where exclusive webinars with uh, world-renowned doctors takes place. He, ha he also has a very famous YouTube channel called Sean Baker MD where uh, he uploads every single day without fail and he has now more than 500 videos which are so interesting and he's one of the pioneers to make this carnivore diet popular among masses and uh, he has uh, written the world's first famous book on carnivore diet titled the carnivore diet and this book is awesome guys if you want to debate vegans or you want to talk with anyone regarding meat, you have to buy this book. And after listening to all this, we cannot deny the fact that Sean is a real superhuman. Thanks, Sean, for coming onto the show. Hey, it's my pleasure. Thanks for having me on. It'd be fun to talk to the folks in India. It's another part of the world I don't get often to, to chat with. Thanks, Sean. So uh, before we go into the interview, uh, where can people connect with you? Uh, well, obviously at MeetRx, I'm there every single day. We do meetings so you can we can talk live in video. So that's every morning at 9 a.m. Pacific time. Um, there is, uh, uh, you know, my, my social media, Instagram. Uh, it's Sean, S-H-A-W-N, Baker, B-A-K-E-R, 1967, which is the year I was born. Uh, there's Twitter where I'm at SBakerMD. And then obviously I've got the YouTube channel, uh, just Sean Baker. So those are the places where I'm most likely to be found. Awesome, Sean. So my first question is, in the book you have mentioned that you used to have a dietary uh, philosophy uh, where you said uh, eat whatever you want and uh, as long as it, as long as you train hard, it, it is okay. So why that, why that does not work then? Well, I kind of joked around that I could eat desserts and other th other foods because I exercised hard. And that worked for, well, at least I thought it worked. I mean, I was probably getting sick earlier than I thought I was. But, you know, it kind of caught up to me by the time I got to my early 40s. Uh, and then I realized that I was starting to become sick despite training very hard as an athlete and being a very successful athlete. Uh, and so I had to make a switch. Uh, and I went through this, you know, basically, I guess now a decade long dietary, uh, uh, you know, uh, exploration and started out with eating a really low fat, high vegetable, lean protein diet, which, you know, did help me lose weight, but it was very unsustainable. And I had a lot of, uh, uh, just, you know, I just didn't feel particularly good on that particular diet. And then I discovered that, uh, putting, a bit more fat and animal fats and a paleo-ish diet helped more. And then I finally eventually got onto a lower carb diet, a ketogenic diet, and then finally this sort of uh, carnivore approach, which I started, you know, three and a half years ago. And it's been the best, the best I've felt in, you know, in my life. And it's, you know, it's just been a really interesting and eye-opening discovery. Yeah, Sean. So what is your opinion on calorie in and calorie out theory? Well, I don't think you can completely discount calories, but I do have to, you do have to realize that, you know, that the, the calories we eat and the calories we burn are dependent somewhat on the types of food we eat. And so, uh, you know, if you eat just, um, you know, a lot of protein, for instance, you're going to have a little bit more ability to eat more calories. You know, there are some studies that support that if you eat a lower carbohydrate diet, you can eat a little bit more calories. 
that that one is those ones are a little more controversial. But the protein is pretty clear uh, that you know protein is. Uh, I don't think there's anybody even the strict calories in calories out people that will deny that protein has a metabolic advantage. And some people don't even consider protein as a macronutrient of you know caloric content it's mostly structural i mean if you eat enough of it you can turn some of that into, into into energy but it's very difficult for the body to do so and that's i think one of the reasons why this carnivore diet you know being higher in protein than most other diets uh, is 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 one of the benefits for that and then of course the low carbohydrate aspect and then the removal of the junk you know because there's a lot of junk in the uh, standard American diet, and I'm sure in the in the, the 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 Indian diet, which is becoming more and westernized with more of the sugars and more of the uh, I think some of the seed oils, which are problematic. And so I think those things uh, together, um, you know, cause problems because it's not just about losing weight. Because there's people that are, you know, sick but still not overweight. And so we have to look at uh, what is our weight made of? Are we mostly muscle? Are we mostly fat? Are we skinny fat? Are we insulin resistant? You know, those things all make a, are important outside of just how much do you weigh? What do you look like in your clothes? You can look pretty good in some clothes and then you take your shirt off and all of a sudden you're, you know, you don't look so good anymore. And so that still counts. Hey, Sean. So, Sean, uh, why do you think uh, health administrators are not interested in lifestyle changes? Well, I don't know, you know, when you say health administrators, um, I, I think that, uh, you know, it depends on who you're talking. About. If you're talking about people that are running hospitals, for instance, that uh, uh, depend on, you know, revenue for the hospital, uh, you know, they, they depend on sick people. You know, it's like the pharmaceutical companies. They depend on sick people. That's their business model. And so if a lifestyle uh, issue does not generate them income, then they're not they're less interested. And that's just normal business. I mean, that's what any business person would do. They're not going to spend a lot of time on things that aren't going to make them money at the end of the day. And so we've got this uh, unfortunate uh, situation, you know, particularly the U.S. healthcare system, where it's largely for profit. And, you know, the same thing with our pharmaceutical industry, which is all for profit, you know. It's at odds when you don't have patients or clients anymore. So that you know, lifestyle message tends to get lost among those folks. Hey, Sean, that's very true. So, uh, what benefits uh, generally we observe in the societies who are exclusively meat based? Well, there are a number of societies that were you know uh, near nearly fully carnivore or or hundred percent carnivore close to it. You know we see these polar populations, whether they're the you know the the Inuit, the uh, Sami, the you know the uh, Nene, other you know, other polar populations, some of the tribes in Africa, the Nilotic Africans like Maasai and some of the others, uh, some of the the Mongolians uh, who largely were, meat base and some of the South American people like the gauchos, um, you know, they generally were free of chronic disease. Uh, and generally, uh, they had a healthy, uh, um, you know, outcome. And, you know, some people will criticize like, you know, it because they don't live as long as some of the other folks. But I mean, you have to realize these people are living on the fringes of society and subsistence situations. They have poor health care. The Inuit, the Inuit, unfortunately, smoke at a rate of about 70%. They have some of the highest smoking rates in the world. So we have to look at all the factors in general. But, you know, for the most part, those people were very, very healthy. And, you know, Weston A. Price and others have documented this. Um, it is, uh, uh, you know, only in recent times that uh, we've kind of sort of forgotten about these folks. And, you know, we tend to, we tend to ignore them when we're talking about what we think is a a healthy diet just because we have this belief that uh, a healthy diet should come from grains and plants and uh, there is a lot of uh, emotional and corporate buy and we know that we can feed the world on grains very cheaply uh, at a very high rate of profit and that is I think a large motivator for the current narrative. Yes, Sean. Sean, uh, there is a misconception in India and in other places that meat is not digestible. What are your thoughts on that? 
Well, I mean, that's clearly wrong. I mean, meat is, uh, well, I will, let me, let me put a caveat to there. For a normal, healthy human being, meat is exceedingly digestible. This is what our whole small intestine and stomach acid is designed to do. This is what we are, you know, this is what we evolved, you know, evolved to do. I mean, this is why we evolved as human beings. I mean, humans have been eating meat since the beginning of time. And I know outside of, you know, different religious beliefs, from an evolutionary standpoint, but I mean, humans have eaten meat for, you know, arguably millions of years, and certainly, you know, if it, depending on what your belief is, thousands of years, if, if not, you know, much more. Um, when we have people that are becoming sick, when their digestive system starts to fail, when they stop producing stomach acid, in that situation, meat become, can become more difficult to digest, but, but that's not a, a fault of the meat, it's the fault of the person has gotten sick. If you can't digest meat, then you're, then you're probably unhealthy. I mean, I think that's, that's, uh, uh, that's the problem there. Sean, these days, many health experts are saying to maintain an alkaline body. So what do you say about that? Well, I mean, you know, so we, our human body does a very good job maintaining a pH between 7.35 and 7.45. And that is done by breathing. It's done by our kidneys. It's done by our bicarb bicarbohydrate buffering system. And food does not really change that very much at all. It's very, very difficult. It doesn't matter if you're drinking all the alkaline water or you're thinking you're eating alkaline foods. I mean, everything that gets into our digestive tract first passes through this a stomach which has a gastric pH of 1.5, which is incredibly incredibly acidic. Um, you know, you can alter your urine pH a little bit by eating, you know, maybe a more animal-based diet, but that really doesn't really change uh, the alkalinity of, of the cellular structure of our body or our blood blood uh, pH. So this it's mostly just not really based on any good science. There's some belief that eating higher protein diets will cause um, you know, uh, leaching of calcium through the bones, but really that's been disproven. It's shown that basically higher protein diets just, just lead to higher absorption of cal calcium in the gut. And so when you absorb higher calcium in the gut, you just excrete more in the urine. And so it's not a, you know, it's not that you're pulling it from your bones. Some of the people that believe this alkaliz alkalinization uh, theory, that's, that's actually, just, actually, actually just false. Sean, uh, in the book you have written that uh, truth is whatever we hear the most. What do you mean by that? Well, I mean, it's it's almost like a political battle. You know, whoever says something the, many, the most times, whether it's true or not, people start to believe it. And so uh, if you hear the same thing over and over again, you, you believe it. And then, you know, uh, like the, the, the belief that meat is bad. Well, now we've got this population of people that eat either only meat or a lot of meat, and guess what's happening? They're getting healthy, like you you experienced yourself. I mean, you know, so we're, we have to challenge some of these beliefs uh, to find the truth. And, you know, you find the truth by actually testing it, not just by listening to what someone else has to say. And that's what I tell people. Don't, don't necessarily listen to me or anyone else. You know, test it out in yourself and see what your, your results are. And then you'll get something that is some kind of result and that'll be the truth uh, that'll be your truth and you know like i said there's a lot of money invested in uh, in a particular narrative and there's a lot of people that spend a lot of money to tell us to, to believe a certain way because they, 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 it, it's profitable for them and so um most people when it comes to diet don't really you know they don't think that much about it. it's like what tastes good what can i get what can i afford and if people tell you that you know eating this cheap highly processed food is both good for you and you know it tastes good well you're going to do that and 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 you know and if, if they tell you that it's healthy you know why would you question that and why do we see so many people in your country that have heart disease and diabetes and uh, uh you know <laughs> i don't think it's because they're eating you know a bunch of meat because you know obviously you're in a country where meat is not as popular as where, I, where i'm at or other places Sean, uh, why do you think that this bias towards uh, plant-based diet is uh, like uh, creeped throughout the world? Well, I think recently, uh, well, first of all, one, it's affordable. You know, it's 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 what we can afford to feed people um, with 
with good good return on our investment. And right now, um, as uh, you know, people are talking about climate change and other things. Uh, th- th- there's been people that have put this narrative out that, that the climate change is being caused by animals, and that is, you know, these animals have been around for literally hundreds of thousands of years in roughly the same concentrations that they are now. I mean, we have more domestic animals and less wild animals, but animals are not causing the climate change. And you know, some of the maybe the oil and gas companies they find it convenient to put pin it all on the on the animals, and so now there's a uh, a new market emerging with this fake meat, these, you know, these alternate protein sources where people see uh, potentially a hundred billion dollar a year market. And so this is, so now they're getting involved and they've got all this capital. They've got something like, you know, $5 trillion of capital to, to help develop this, uh, this market. And so they're, they're, they're pushing for it, you know, not just the, the, the sort of the vegan, vegetarian, ethical folks. It's now big business. It wants to get this because they see money. And this is why we're seeing this take off more recently is because they want you to, to buy into this belief so they can create this market, so they can sell you this highly refined, highly profitable, but, you know, cheap and unhealthy food. And so that's really what's going on with that. Sean, uh, what do you say to the people who say that uh, killing animals is unethical? Well, um you know, uh, animals are going to, you know, when it comes to food or almost any consumable good, animals will be will be died and die and killed. I mean, this is this is the nature of life. Um, I think what we have to realize is, you know, whether these animals are killed incidentally to grow soybeans, and 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 mind you, it's not incidental. I mean, when they spray pesticides and they kill animals, small animals that are eating the food, those animals are killed as well, and so. No matter what you eat, animal death will be involved. Now the question is, what's the most humane way to kill those animals? And and you know, does raising them perhaps giving them a longer life than they would have had in the wild? You know, if we look at ruminant animals, for instance, um, you know, most ruminant animals in the wild will die as 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 infants. They won't make it to adulthood. They'll be eaten by another animal, by a predator. They'll die a death where they're ripped to pieces while they're alive and what we see at least in the united states and and other western countries where they you know grow you know they they raise cattle for slaughter you know they they live a couple years and then they're killed like within an instant within a you know just within a second and then we we cherish their their products their milk their meat their uh you know the rest of the products we use their hides all that we use those animals 100 percent whereas if your animal is killed to grow a soybean or some other, you know, other you know, corn or rice or some other product, those animals are just, you know, left to rot in a field, and their 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 body is not even utilized, you know, at least by humans. I mean, they might you might argue that some scavenger animal might eat it or bacteria will eat it, but uh, at the end of the day, we all die. We all are eaten. All humans, will, human beings, will be eaten. Uh, every animal on the planet will be eaten, either dead or alive. Um, and that's just the, the, the circle of life. And I think that what we can do is realize that and do our best to make that as, as, as a humane uh, death as possible and not to pretend and diminish the fact that millions and billions of animals die for crop agriculture as well. I mean, that's, that's, just, the, that's just the way life is. Yes, that's absolutely correct, John. Uh, so, uh, Sean, the recommended daily allowances are based on a high carbohydrate, uh, high carbohydrate diet, right? So, does that applicable to carnivores and other low carb uh, people? Well, I would say um, we don't really know for sure. I would say likely it is not. I mean, I, there's many. In fact, there are there are examples where people are recommending that. For instance. When we look at the recommended daily allowances, we know clearly they were developed on high carb populations, and we see that they're already starting to make concessions to that. We know, for instance, like the zinc requirement. So zinc is a vital mineral, but we know that when people are eating a lot of phytic acid, and we get phytic acid from things like uh, beans and other other plant based foods, when your diet is high in phytic acid, you know they say if we have a thousand milligrams of phytic acid in our diet then you need to double your zinc intake. And if you have 2000 milligrams of phytic acid in diet, you need to triple your zinc intake. So we are seeing, you know, concessions that eating different diets results in different 
you know, requirements. And we see that probably with vitamin C with a carnivore based diet. We see that with research going back, you know, a hundred years, things like thiamine. We know that, uh, for instance, in, in animal studies, animals fed low carb diets would need lower thiamine levels in their serum to prevent, you know, a disease called beriberi, uh, which can be fatal, which can cause both neurological and cardiac diseases. But animals on a high carb diet uh, needed a much higher serum thiamine, thiamine level to re prevent the same disease. We see that with vitamin D. We saw that with the Inuit populations and preventing rick rickets. People that ate their traditional meat-based diet had lower serum vitamin levels, vitamin D levels, but did not get rickets. But if you added flour and sugar to their diet, they would get rickets even with the same vitamin D levels. So, uh, yeah, I do believe that there is a, uh, a different requirement for different diets with, 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 with regard to essential nu nutrients. Sean, uh, in the newspaper, uh, many headlines comes like, uh, if you if you eat this food, you are really you are risk will increase fifty percent, hundred percent. Can you differentiate between uh, uh, what is a actual risk and a relative risk? Yeah, sure. So if I told you that um, if you walk outside during a rainstorm, your risk for being struck by lightning was doubled and went up a hundred percent. You would say, well, that's pretty scary. Maybe I shouldn't walk outside during, during a rainstorm. But if I told you that your risk for getting hit by lightning was 1 in 10 million and it went to 2 in 10 million, then your absolute risk went up by 1 in, a million, one in 10 million, which is a tiny, tiny increase, even though it's doubled. So the question is, is it really that much risk? And so we see that with things like these, the World Health Organization's sort of claim about cancer and meat. You know, if you eat red meat, your risk of your relative risk of, of getting cancer goes up by 17 percent. Well, that sounds like a kind of a big number. But if you look at the absolute risk, it's only something like one percent. So you're like, well, it only went up by one percent. But then if you put it into perspective and you say, what other things can raise my risk of cancer? Well, being overweight will increase that risk, not by 17 percent, by maybe 50 to 150 percent. And so. You know, we have to put all these things in perspective. You know, what if I have diabetes? Well, then my risk may go up 300%. What if I have a lot of visceral fat? My risk may go up 600%. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's very important to know what the frequency of the disease is and, and to know what the absolute risk. Because, you know, if you, like I said, if your risk of getting struck by lightning doubles, goes up 100%, but the risk is only 2 in 10 million, then it's it's not really a risk. It's not really a big risk. And so you have to, you have to understand and speak to both. And a lot of people are very deceptive when they use relative risk because um, it really doesn't make much of a difference. You know, you can, you can look at these horrible big looking numbers and say, well, it didn't really change, didn't change things much for me. And so you have to look at, and you have to look at other risk factors as well. That's super interesting, Sean. Thanks for the clear explanation. I want to ask you an off topic question. Uh, you are a very big guy. So what made you to do the CrossFit activities these days? Well, I've been, you know, I've, I've so I'm, you know, like I said, I'm six foot five, uh, you know, 110 kilos. Typically, uh, I was a six, successful in a bunch of sports. And, you know, after about five, five years or so, I sometimes get bored with a sport I'm competing at. Like I just won a bunch of world championships and I won a world championship and set world records in rowing, which I've been competing at in the last six or seven years. And um, I've kind of found that I'm losing interest in it because I can't get, you know, you once you start winning world championships, you're like, I'm, I'm, I'm not going to get much better. Uh, so I'm, I'm, it's just a new challenge for me as I get into, you know, I'm 50, 53, I'm looking at by 55, hopefully being able to compete at a higher level at CrossFit. Um, so because of that, I, I'm just getting a little bit leaner. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to, uh, you know, drop, you know, just, a, you know, five, six, seven kilos and lean out and I'll be more competitive at that weight. Um, just cause I've got some disadvantages cause I'm so tall, uh, doing gymnastic type stuff. is going to be a challenge for me and being heavier is going to make it even more of a challenge. And so I can't change how tall I am, but I can change how, how much I weigh pretty easily. And I've, I've done that very easily in the context of a carnivore diet. And I'm, you know, right now, quite honestly, I'm probably the leanest probably about the leanest I've ever been in my life, you know, with best body composition at 53, which I'm pretty, you know, pretty happy about, which is, 
you know, kind of fun to be able to say that, you know, you're still getting better even though you're getting older. That's why you are super awesome, Sean. Okay. Uh, Sean, uh, is there any positive role for uh, long time fasting in carnivore diet? Well, yeah, I mean, that's uh, that's a good question. So I think that uh, fasting for a lot of people is beneficial. I don't know how often that's done in, in your culture, but uh, particularly in, in many diets, fasting is helpful because, you know, you're just not eating the junk. You know, if, if anything else, you give your body a period of recovery. Um, there's physiologic fasting that occurs naturally on a carnivore diet. So most people find that their appetite is pretty pretty minimal throughout the day and they can they can get away with you know eating maybe once or twice a day uh, very easily on a carnivore diet. Now there's people that uh, uh, will combine a carnivore diet with a little bit more sort of uh, deliberate fasting, you know it's, you know intermittent fasting or, or even a, the extended fasting where they may go a day or two without eating. And I think that can have an additional role for some people. For some people, you know, it depends on the person, really. Um, I think if you're, if you're treating diabetes, if you're treating a sort of morbid obesity, that can be an additional tool. And I use it as a tool. You can, and like anything, you can overuse it. And some people can get into trouble when they fast too much. And so, uh, and then your body will adapt to it. And so it's, it's probably it has a role kind of intermittently in the fact that you might do this, you know, not on a regular basis, but on an intermittent, inter, in, intermittent and infrequent basis, you know, maybe once a month or once a week, or you change it up a little bit. So your body just doesn't get used to this. And then kind of, you know, sort of what your body likes to do is say, well, if you're not going to feed me, I'm going to shut down and, you know, I'm not going to, you're going to be cold and we're not going to produce as much heat and we're going to shut down things to conserve energy. And so when you do it on a, an infrequent and, uns, you know, and an unpredictable basis, then your body doesn't have time to adapt. And then it, then you just kind of improve and then you go back to your regular food. Uh, and if you're on a carnivore diet, that, that can work too. There's many people that don't need to do it on a carnivore diet, however. I'd say a lot of people, they just, I think the natural appetite suppressing effect of the diet is enough. Uh, but there's a few people that, that just need a little bit extra and I think that can be a benefit. So it's, I'm not, I, you know, I, I'm always... My overlying um, sort of philosophy has always been find what's working, you know, and if it's going to work for you, it's going to work for it and not to be dismissive of, of, of anything, you know. And, and like I said, for some people, a carnivore diet works great. Some people add a little bit of fruit to that and it works for them. Some people add a little bit of fasting that and work for them. I'm all for doing what works for you because at the end of the day, the only thing I'm dogmatic about is do what makes you healthiest. And if, 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 that fasting helps you to be healthier and there's no negative consequences, that's great. Sean, what are your thoughts on monitoring things through blood testing? Well, it depends on what you're monitoring. If you're monitoring a disease like diabetes, uh, then I think it makes sense. Um, I think that we do have to be very uh, mindful of the context in which we uh, apply those sort of blood tests because one, we have to realize they're very variable. They can change every single day. They can change throughout the day. Uh, for instance, things like vitamin D levels can change as much as 30% from, you know, within a period of eight hours. And so we have to, we have to know what's going on with the person. And we know, we also know that people can have slightly out of normal ranges, reference ranges and realize that one, that may be normal for that person in their particular diet, or it may change tomorrow or it may not be clinically relevant. And so we have to just, we have to just not to say, you know, this is a blood test and it, and it tells us everything we need to know. We need to know what's going on with that person. Uh, and so I, when some people send me their blood tests to look at, I say, well, I need to know more. I just can't, I just can't tell you, am I healthy or not based on a single blood test or a single series of blood tests? Because you can have people that are extremely unhealthy that have very good looking blood tests. And you can have people that, are extremely healthy. There was blood tests may not fall perfectly within the parameters. And so it's something that, uh, you know, I don't get too hung up on. I don't dismiss it completely, but I just say you have to understand what you're looking at and understand the context uh, in which you're looking at those things. Hey, Sean, for example, the cholesterol was also thought to be bad. So we cannot uh, 
completely think that the ranges are the real ranges. Well, yeah, when it comes to cholesterol, um, there is uh, a lot of controversy. I mean, it's becoming more and more uh, nuanced. I mean, certainly in a lot of people, high cholesterol is a problem, you know, and, and the problem is those people often are metabolically unhealthy in general, and they have uh, diabetes or prediabetes or hyperinsulinemia. They have chronic inflammation. They have a lot of visceral fat. Uh, you know, they have, you know, the, just a, a metabolic environment in which having higher cholesterol, and now it may be that that cholesterol is now being oxidized in that environment or it's being glycated, you know, having sugar attached to it in that environment. And that's what's making it unhealthy and more prone to cause uh, cardiac disease. And there are other people in which, uh, they are metabolically very healthy, and they have low levels of inflammation. They have normal, well-controlled blood glucose, and they don't have hyper hyperglycemia. They have very low levels of visceral fat. And in those people, it very may well be that higher cholesterol is not as problematic. And I think we're still trying to figure that out. But uh, some of the data we're seeing seems to show that, you know, having low triglycerides and a relatively high HDL in the setting of higher LDL cholesterol may not be as problematic as someone who's, you know, got a whole host of problems. Sean, in India and in many Asian countries, many people eat meat, but they combine it with lots of carbohydrates. So what is the problem of mixing carbohydrates with meat? Well, I think, you know, and meat is not just protein. We have to remember meat does have fat in there. And I think when you mix carbohydrates and fat together, you're, you're, in, a, you're in an unfavorable situation. We know that, uh, in fact, I just posted a study on my social media looking at the fact that if you're eating a higher carbohydrate, and particularly a higher sugar diet, which is, you know, a lot of, a lot of us do eat, then fat will increase the rate of fat that's deposited in our liver, in our muscles, and that can lead to insulin resistance and diabetes. And so when you couple uh, high carbohydrates and, and often high sugar diets, high fructose diets with higher fat, then you've got a problem. You know, if you take the sugar out of the diet, then you can probably get away with more fat. And then, you know, that's, and that's where this sort of carnivore diet seems to work pretty well. People can eat meat, eat fat and do well. Now, can you overeat fat? you know, and still run into trouble, I think you can. I mean, but I mean, it, it's hard because the, the, the diet of meat, particularly with protein, is satiating. And so it's, it's, it's because it's so satiating, it's hard to get into trouble. It's not that some people, you know, if you, particularly people that have really bad eating disorders and appetite disorders could overeat potentially, but it's really, really hard to do. And it's so satiating for most people. That, uh, that most people just do fine and they lose weight and they lose body fat and their blood glucose improves and their diabetes improves and their inflammation improves. Uh, so yeah, but I mean the combination of um, high sugar diets, high carbohydrate diets, you know, and particularly high fat diets, even if the fat's coming from meat, is, is not a good combination. It's like sending two people in the same door, right? Uh, yeah, I guess you could say that, sure. Uh, so, Sean, uh, which is better, grass-fed or grain-fed meat? Uh, well, I mean, it depends on what context you're talking about. Uh, you know, grain-fed finished meat versus grass-finished meat from in the context of human health, we don't really have any good studies that would point to one way or the other. There's not many studies done on that. Hopefully, we'll get them done. You know, you could make the argument if you're overeating fat, uh, grass finished meat has a little less fat in there. And so you could, you could potentially, you know, if you're eating just lots and lots of fat, uh, then maybe that, in that context, you could do better with grass finished beef and eat a little less fat. You have a little leaner, a little leaner meat. Um, you know, there's, you know, grass finished meat has some compounds that are thought to be more helpful in higher amounts, conjugated linoleic acid, vitamin E, vitamin A zinc and things like that, whereas grain-finished beef has more monounsaturated fats, which some people think are healthier. So it's it's really we don't know for sure um, when it comes to human health. Now, from, from an environmental standpoint, there may be some benefit to the environment for eating not just grass-finished meat, but regeneratively grazed uh, animals where they put carbon back into the soil. And so this is where 
I think it's more of an environmental impact issue than a health issue for most people. Uh, you know, and in some places, uh, what they can afford is is a grain finished product, and you know, it's it's uh, it's a little cheaper to manufacture. Um, you know, as far as you know, raising the animals, feeding them on grain, you can get them, you can get them to market quicker, uh, and you know, it's arguably uh, people can afford that more. And, and I would say that eating the meat you can afford, you know, is probably the, the the most realistic solution. And then hopefully, as time goes by, we'll get we'll make regenerative type of meat more affordable. Whether governments get involved to give those guys uh, incentives to do that. Uh, we don't know. We'll see what happens down the road. Sean, uh, why does vegan diets work initially but uh, cause problems later? Uh, well, I think it's, it's uh, you know, uh, again, in a vegan diet, you have to define it more specifically. There's a lot of people that eat a vegan diet where it's just junk food. I mean, they're eating just vegan junk food, and that's not going to work. They're going to get sick. They're going to they're going to suffer the same problems. They're probably going to get worse than the standard American diet because they're they're, they're lacking even more nutrition because meat is so nutritious. Um, but some people will find if they go from a really junky diet where they're eating a bunch of sugar and garbage and they go on a whole food plant-based diet that doesn't have sugar and it doesn't have uh, a lot of refined products and it doesn't have uh, a lot of oil, that they will lose weight, they'll lose body fat, they may improve some of their markers uh, but often long term, they find that they start to, to, to miss out on nutrition. They, 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 uh, many of them will lose muscle. Uh, they will find that uh, uh, many of them develop digestive problems. They will have long term deficiency issues. Not all of them, but some of them do. And, you know, some of them will have, uh, you know, problems with uh, not having enough fat in the diet and that, that, that often can manifest itself with uh, a host of problems, sometimes mental health issues, uh, sometimes uh, degenerative uh, neurologic issues, uh, autoimmune diseases, things like that long term. And again, this is not every single person that does that, but we do seem to see it on a, uh, you know, particularly digestive issues. People find they have a lot of digestive issues, a lot of uh, bloating, gas, chronic, you know, constipation, um, malabsorption problems, um, you know, just, digest a pain and uh, that's that becomes more and more more common we're saying sean uh, is carnivore diet affordable um well i mean again it depends on uh where you are you know what country you're in i suppose um, many people do end up saving money because they eat a lot less i mean you find that you eat a lot less volume of food you don't need to take supplements you're not wasting food. I know, and again, I don't know what it's like in India, but I know a lot of food gets thrown away because it goes bad. Uh, so you don't really run into that. It's very unusual for meat to get thrown out for going bad. Um, and, you know, depending on how you source it, uh, it can be very economical. Eggs can be very affordable and eggs can be part of the diet. You know, some people that include dairy can make it work. It's very, it can be very affordable. Meat can be can be affordable, you know, ground ground beef or, you know, maybe not in India, you might be able to find uh, lamb or some fish or some other things that are cheaper that uh, you can make it you can make it work. And, you know, if you if you look at cutting out all the supplements and all the extra extra stuff that comes in the diets, um, it can be, you know, it can be cheap for, for, for many people. Depends. Again, it depends on how you do it. Hey, Sean, uh, Sean uh, in the context of COVID-19 what one can do to mm -hmm. strengthen the immune system? Well, I mean, you know, obviously avoiding um, exposure is, is helpful. I mean, we, you know, obviously you're there, I think washing hands and all the, all the stuff, you know, wearing masks, potentially avoiding contact with sick people and big crowds and all that stuff seems to be helpful. But, uh, you know, the, the folks that are suffering from this and having the worst complications are the people that have underlying health conditions and that's diabetes that's obesity that's you know uh, uh, under underlying respiratory issues um and age you know you can't change how old you are but i mean what you can do is do lifestyle things that minimize those comorbidities and we know that you know p p helping your blood sugar you can do that on a low carbohydrate diet uh there are uh, there are compounds in whole foods and meat included that 
do help strengthen our immune system. You know, there's there's plenty of research that supports that. What not to do is just eat a bunch of junk, you know, sit there and drink a bunch of alcohol and, you know, you know, uh, eat a bunch of sugary foods and process oils. That's just going to make you worse and more susceptible. It's going to weaken your immune system. So avoiding those things and eating whole foods, um, you know, getting some exercise. If you can get if you're allowed to, you know, get in the sunshine, even if you're standing in your back back of your house, get some sunshine every day. And um, those things, I think, will be helpful. And then, of course, you know, uh, it's important to keep a uh, an upbeat, positive mental outlook, because for the vast majority, even even uh, throughout the world, even even if, you know, a few million people end up dying from this, which it probably won't be that many. But even even though that occurs, the odds of you personally getting sick from it are extremely, extremely low still. It's not that we should ignore it and you know, you know, not try to minimize the spread to other people, but most people are going to do okay and be healthy. But uh, if you want to put yourself in a higher risk category, stay obese, stay diabetic and, you know, and, 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 and eat more junk and you're going to, uh, you're going to increase the odds you are going to get sick. Sean, many people disregard anecdotal evidences. So what is the importance of anecdotal uh, evidences in your opinion? Well, certainly an, a single anecdote is, is, is not really strong evidence. You know, once you start getting more and more of those anecdotes, then we start to be able to, do, to develop hypotheses. And so now, you know, again, we can use this in the context of a carnivore diet where we have literally tens of thousands of anecdotes and they're all basically saying the same thing. You know, look, I got better. My health is getting better. That drives hypothesis. And this is what an epidemiologic study does. You know, an epidemiologic study is you know essentially the same as an anecdote on on its uh, you know on its ability to show causation. I mean it's still hypothesis generating. So, like when people uh, discovered that uh, stomach ulcers were caused by H. pylori, this was an anecdote. There was a guy who had that theory, and he was the only one that thought that. And the only way he had to, he had to actually swallow the, the bacteria, gave himself an ulcer, and then treated it to prove this this and this completely changed the way we treat stomach ulcers in the world you know uh and so we're you know like like uh, we said we've got the hypothesis that a meat-based diet can help with a lot of diseases and we are now in the process of doing studies which is what results from the anecdotes and so the anecdotes are important they're starting points and to disregard them all is is is, is just silly i mean we should say okay that's interesting Maybe it's true, maybe it's not. Let's test it. Fortunately, there's some researchers that are now testing it, and we'll have some more answers soon. And then hopefully, uh, if the initial research shows that one, it's safe and effective, but, or appears to be, then we can proceed with the, with the studies that need to be done. But anecdotes are where they start, so you can't just dismiss them all. Sean, you have mentioned that uh, there's a study going on uh, regarding the carnivore diet. Would you like to share something regarding that? Yeah, so this is a study that is coming out of Harvard University. Dr. David Ludwig and Belinda Leonards are the senior and principal investigators in this study, and they are gathering information that people have been on a carnivore diet for six months or more. They're going to, you know, see what what their results have been, and then they're going to, for a select number of them, they're going to look at some lab values. And, you know, this will take, oh, about a month, two months to gather the data, uh, and then hopefully... You know, it'll get written up and published shortly after that. Um, so that's, I think it'll be the largest carnivore study ever done. Um, it will likely make it into a very high impact journal and it'll be one of the most read articles in that journal. Uh, they've added their research. These guys are excellent researchers. They've done that with type 1 diabetes and low carb diets. They had that published in the journal of Pediatrics, which was the most widely read article of that journal for the year. And so I think we'll see something similar with carnivore. And I think this is going to further legitimize what I've been doing and will give more and more physicians more courage and opportunity to use this for a lot of conditions. And whether it's autoimmune disease or digestive diseases or mental health diseases or all the other, you know, all the, all the things that this seems to be helping, um, hopefully we'll see more and more people willing to try it out. Sean, uh... 
where can people connect with you again? Yeah, like we said, meetrx.com is, is something that I am obviously very passionate about. As you know, you're there almost every day and uh, we have a great discussion. Uh, so I talk to people every single day. So if you want to ask me a direct question, just show up at the MeetRx meeting and I, I do my best to answer those questions every day. Um, if you just want to follow along with my social media, it's Sean Baker, 1967, S-H-A, uh, W-N-B-A-K-E-R, 1967 on Instagram. YouTube, I put up a video nearly every day. So if you just want to hear my thoughts, I usually either go over some study or, you know, I try to mix it up a little bit, put some, try to keep it interesting with a variety of different topics. And then uh, I'm on Twitter, uh, you know, pretty regularly as well, S Baker MD. So those are the major areas where you can find me. Sean, uh, there is a one month uh, free trial going on uh, MetaRx, right? Right. So while the coronavirus is going on, we decided to try it because I think a lot of people um, feel they're worried, they're lonely, they're scared, they're isolated, um, you know, whether it's socially or social distancing um, throughout the world. And this is a forum where, you know, and it, you don't have to be a carnivore on a carnivore diet to join, but if you want to just get a, a group of com a community of people that are looking to try to improve their health and support each other and help each other transition in whatever way they can to different diets. Uh, we're offering that just to get people to, you know, we just want to help, we want to help people, you know, not get, you know, hurt by this stress because a lot of people are losing jobs and are depressed. And, you know, there's people that do, th you know, things that are, uh, bad when they're depressed and you know having someone to talk to is helpful and we've got like i said for those people that are interested in a carnivore diet or, or carnivore ish diet we've got hundreds and hundreds of recipes we've got all kinds of meetings we've got uh very uh, uh very affordable coaching our coaches are, are just incredibly affordable and great coaches we've got great success with those folks we've got all the research that you could ask we've got all kinds of resources on you know, finding, you know, quality meat products and different and discounts on products that could some of it, some of them are shipped around the world. So we've got a really, uh, you know, just a growing community and a, and a huge resource center and success stories. We've got hundreds and hundreds of success stories. We've got the largest success story library on the planet. You know, we are basically the, 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 the one stop shop for meat based diets that will provide everything you need there. And we're, we're, we're continuing to grow you know, every week with more and more stuff. So anyway. Sean, before we leave, I want to say how I feel about you to the audience. So first okay. of all, <laughs> Thanks. So first of all, I have discovered you through Dr. Ken Berry's recommendation. And after that, uh, I have started to look at your videos and you used to upload every single day without fail. And uh, I used to like, I have get used to your videos every day. So whenever I go to YouTube, I used to watch your videos. And suddenly, uh, one day in December, you have announced World Carnivore Month in January. And that is the real turning point in my life, which uh, revolutionized my life because uh, uh, I have lost 25 pounds in one month alone after going 100% carnivore. Before that, uh, while I was on keto, I was losing the weight, but I was uh, it, it was like a slow process. But uh, after going on carnivore diet, which is very delicious, by the way, uh, I have lost more than 52 pounds till now. And I'm really, really grateful to you for that. And also, uh, I have found the, uh, that the MetaRx community is uh, so friendly and uh, we talk every day there. And uh, I have got the chance to see you every day and talk with you, which I thought was a dream. So thanks, uh, Dr. Sean, for making uh, everyone's life a better place. And uh, guys, uh, buy this book. And I have read more than 250 books in my life. But this is one of the most aesthetically pleasing book you have, you will ever find. And it is so informative. And also join us on uh, MeetRx, uh, where uh, we talk about various things. And you can talk with Sean directly, which is uh, like a super blessing. So thanks, Sean, for coming. Yeah, I mean, yeah, obviously with your audience, I assume a lot of the folks in India there, um, obviously a carnivore diet is, is probably a little harder to find there, but it's, you know, for those people that are willing to try it out, and we love having, you know, BNS and his perspective in there and hearing other parts of the world, so we'd love to have you come join us. So 
Uh, again, thanks for thanks for having me on, BNS. It's been a pleasure. I enjoyed chatting with you and getting to know you a little better. Uh, so this has been great. Thank you. Thank you, Sean. Hey guys, subscribe to BNS Goku Great.